Hey guys, I wanted to read a chapter of Smells Like Dog. Um, we've been reading this in class and we're on chapter 14. So I'm just going to do a little recap so that you can remember what's going on because I know it's been a long time since we've read this. So if you remember, um, in Smells Like Dog, our main character is Homer Pudding, and he, his uncle, uh, Uncle Drake, has just been eaten by a giant carnivorous tortoise, and he has sent Homer his most treasured possession, which Homer believes is a coin attached to Dog, the Basset Hound, his, uh, his collar and it has the letters L-O-S-T on it. So Homer's been tasked with trying to figure out what is, uh, why this, what these letters mean, what this coin is for. Now, this dog is very special as well because it does not smell. You can't smell anything. So um, there's been some discussion about whether they're gonna keep the dog because he's caused some trouble and Homer has uh, just recently gone to this, the public library. He snuck out in the middle of the night and he went to the public library to try to figure out what these, what these letters stand for. And he burns down the library on accident. Um, he gets out and he gets home and his sister Gwendolyn has convinced him to run away to the city where they have been invited to, Homer has been invited to be the VIP at a party at the Museum of Natural History, which is Gwendolyn's favorite place. So she has convinced him to go because they will be grounded forever and will never be able to go there again. And um, they have arrived at the train station. They are on the train. Homer has lost the coin. It's on the ground and um, dog did something very strange, which was he, um, he smelled, he seemed to smell it, um, and we're not sure what that's about. Um, and it was stuck under the largest boot, black boot Homer had ever seen. So here it is, chapter 14, the elongated lady. It's not nice to make fun of people just because they have big feet. There are many smart, nice, talented people who happen to have feet like dinosaurs, and it causes them great embarrassment when their feet keep elevator doors from closing, or when they have to stand sideways on the escalator, or stick their legs out of the sunroof. Dog whimpered and scratched at the massive boot. Flakes of dried mud fell onto the floor. Homer, still crouching, thought that he might be able to slide the coin free, sorry, this did something, there we go, <clears throat> with his Swiss army knife before the boot's owner even noticed. But just when he reached into his pocket, a hissing noise issued from somewhere overhead. He squinted as the lantern lit up the row of seats. Do you like sitting on the floor? A baritone voice asked. I sit on the floor when I'm feeling too sad to sit on the couch. When I'm extra sad, I take long walks. Nighttime is the best time for a long, sad walk. Homer tilted all the way back to get a full view of the speaker. Up, 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 she went. An expanse of black cape that ended near the ceiling where her head happened to be. Homer cleared his throat and said loudly so that she could hear him all the way up there. I'm sorry to bother you, but that's mine, he pointed. The woman set the lantern on the seat beside her. Then she leaned forward. Her long silver hair tickled Homer's face. This dog stopped scratching as she lifted her boot and picked up the coin with the fingers the size of hot dogs. She looked at one side, then at the other. Without any sort of expression, she returned the coin to Homer. Thank you. He clutched it in his sweaty palm, silently swearing to never lose it again. The woman stared at Homer. Homer stared at the woman. Dog 
stared at a cockroach as it scurried past. Then he ate it. Hey, you still owe me $10, the conductor said, walking to the back row. If you don't pay, I'll have to deposit you at the next station. The woman tilted her head, studying Homer as if he were a brine shrimp in a petri dish. Do you wish to be deposited at the next station? She raised her oversized eyebrows. Homer shook his head. He'd never met a woman with such a low voice. She sounded like Mr. Fitzwaller, who sang in the very back row of the Milky Dale Community Choir. The next station is a dreary place indeed. The woman sat up straight and reached into a black purse. Conductor, this boy does not wish to be deposited at the next station, so I shall pay the amount due. She handed a $10 bill to the conductor. In return, he handed three tickets to Homer, then walked to the next car. Homer peered down the aisle. Gwendolyn, who was busy sorting through her duffel bag, trying to figure out which of her animals would most impress Madame La Directeur, had forgotten all about her brother. Homer shoved the tickets into a pocket. Thanks again. Then a question slipped out of his mouth. Are you from Iceland? He had every reason to believe the woman was Icelandic because on his eighth birthday, Uncle Drake had given him a book called Long Forgotten Lands. The inset maps were gloriously painted in rich sepia tones. His favorite title was titled The Land of Giants. According to that chapter, a race of very tall people had once inhabited Iceland. There, deep beneath the volcanoes, they had mined for emeralds, sapphires, and rubies. The woman folded her gargantuan hands. I am not from Iceland. Are you from Iceland? Homer's neck started to cramp, so he moved into the seat across from the woman. I'm from Milkydale. I thought you were from Iceland because you're... He hesitated, not wanting to insult her. Ah, I see where you are going with this. She pulled her cape around her shoulders. You believe that I am a giant. Well, I am, but not the kind to which you refer. I was born with a condition that made me grow very fast. In the same way that your dog was born with a condition that kept him from growing. He's got a condition? His breed has a form of dwarfism. That's why his legs are disproportionate to his body. Dog walked in a circle, then lay at Homer's feet. His legs are kind of short, Homer said. Hey, do you like dogs? This one's real nice, and he needs a home. My dad won't let me keep him. She frowned. I do not keep animals. I tend to sit on them. Not on purpose, of course. That dog is a fine-looking hound. I'm sure someone will want him. I hope so. Homer reached down and patted dog's head. I might have trouble finding him a place. He can't smell. We all have things we cannot do. She gazed out the top of the window. Darkness whooshed past. I cannot ride a Ferris wheel. I do not fit, you see. A tear sparkled in her right eye. Homer imagined the Ferris wheel at the Milky Dale County Fair with its bright lights and tin can music. Sitting at the very top of the wheel was the closest he'd ever come to flying. Ferris wheels aren't that great, he lied. Thank you for attempting to make me feel better, but I still feel as sad as always. The tear wiggled, then fell onto her wide cheek. There are so many things I cannot do. I cannot ride a horse. I cannot thread a needle or fit into an elevator. I cannot sneak up on anyone. Homer felt sorry for this woman. Her sadness reached across the space between their seats and tugged at him. I can't play football, he said. I'm not fast enough. So I always get tackled. 
and I can't do oral reports because my heart starts pounding so loud that I can't hear my own voice. And I can't go to the library because I got in trouble and Dad said I couldn't go. He bit his lower lip. He was about to confide something to a total stranger, but he felt as if she'd understand. The library burned down. His stomach lurched as the blaze ignited, fresh and furious in his mind. It was an accident, but it was my fault. That's a terrible thing, burning down a library. The tall woman continued to stare out the window. I, too, have done terrible things unspeakable things, but I cannot call them accidents. She whipped her head around so quickly that Homer jumped in his seat. You should keep that coin in a safe place. The city is full of thieves. She reached into her bag again and pulled out a matchbook. If you tuck your coin into this, it will be safe. No thief would want to steal a matchbook. Homer smiled nervously, then took the matchbook. It read, Zelda's Trinket Shop. As the lady watched, he tucked the coin into the matchbook, then stuck it in his pocket. It seems like a good idea. Not as brilliant as hiding it behind a fold of sagging basset hound skin, but good nonetheless. A whistle blew and the train slowed. Gloomy more, oh, gloomy more, the conductor announced from the doorway. All off for gloomy more. Brakes squealed as the train came to a full stop. This is my destination. The tall woman collected her bag and lantern, then raised herself from the seat, bending to keep from bumping her head. It was nice to meet you, Homer Pudding. It was nice to meet you, too, he said. Once the woman had departed, Homer returned to his sister's row. Dog followed, eating a piece of discarded bubble gum along the way. Did you find your coin? Gwendolyn asked, dusting off one of her stuffed rats. Yeah. Did you give it to the conductor? No, but the tickets are paid for. Don't worry. Homer shuffled his feet. Hey, Gwendolyn, could you not tell anyone about the coin? I mean, that it was from Uncle Drake. Gwendolyn shrugged. <laughs> I don't care about your stupid coin. Homer took the window seat opposite his sister. Outside at the edge of the gloomy Moor station, the woman raised her lantern and looked back at Homer. Then she waved. He politely waved back. With a swirl of her black cape, she disappeared into a cloud of steam. It had been nice of her to pay the fare, but he wondered as the train pulled away what kind of terrible, unspeakable thing she had done. And then a shiver darted down his backside. She'd called him Homer Pudding. He didn't recall mentioning his name. And next we will read chapter 15, Tomato Soup Girl. Ooh, I can't wait. Okay, I'll see y'all later, guys. Love you. Bye.